have someone near you and say, what's up? And you can be seated. If you're watching online, pop into the chat and say hi. Shout out to Preacher Man Ken, who hosts our line, online location each week. So, as I was preparing this message, I thought about asking God, you know, because we talk to God a lot while we're preparing messages. Um, I thought about asking him, you know, like, hey, God, give me this, like, give me a good story to open with. And then I remembered, I do not pray for that anymore. Let me tell you why. Two weeks ago today, 4.30, 5 o'clock, no, yeah, 4.30, in the evening, I was driving to a speaking engagement. I was asked to speak for this women's event in Isanti. And as I was driving there from my home in St. Paul, I was, you know, kind of, it was Sunday night, so I had like all the church stuff in my head. So I was kind of, I was talking about friendship. That's what they asked me to talk about. So I was kind of rehearsing in my mind, like my message, and I was praying. And as I was driving and praying, I was like, God, give me a good story to open with because these ladies do not know me at all. And so it's nice to open with something that makes them chuckle and realize we're all just dorks. And then, you know, we, we can talk about Jesus and stuff. And so God just like, you know, I just didn't have anything. I was like, oh, well, I'll just give my message. It's good. But um, <laughs> I got to the location where this event was and it was just too early. And you know how you don't want to show up too early for something because then you stand around awkwardly and you have to talk to people and it's scary. Um, so I was like, I'm just gonna drive on by. So I drove on by kind of out this like side road in the beautiful countryside of Isanti off 65. Beautiful sunshiny day last Sunday it was. Uh, the back road was plowed but covered, you know, with snow. But it was beautiful. I was just, I'll just drive down this back road, find a place to stop, pray, you know, just re, you know, I just had some time and it was great and it was beautiful and I like my car and, you know, like the whole thing. I'm just driving along. So I got out to kind of where the road took a sharp bend but it was really wide and I thought I'll just do a U turn here, kind of go back and then stop, have a place to pray and sit. Well, as I did the U-turn, I have like kind of a cool car. So I was like, I'm just gonna, you know, gun it and just kick the back end around really quick. I forgot it's all wheel drive. So I gunned it and went right into a snowbank <laughs> on a bright sunshiny day in the middle of nowhere, I Sandy. And Eric was in St. Paul getting ready for church. And it was 30 minutes from a speaking engagement, like 30 minutes until it started. And I was one mile from the place. And all I could think, you know, at first you're like, oh, huh. oh, because I realized I could not get out. And so I, my first thought was call Larry. He's our old neighbor in Isanti and he fixes everything and rescues us. So I thought I should call Larry and then I thought I should probably call Eric first or he might be insulted that I called Larry first. So I called Eric and he goes, hang on, I'll call Larry. So... He called Larry, who lived 10 minutes away, and by God's grace, had just returned from the work they were doing in our new Albertville location, and he was just almost to his house. He picked up a tow rope, he came out, pulled me out, I got to the place on time. But the whole way on time, I'm sitting in my car, in high heels, stuck in a snowdrift. I'm thinking to myself, God, why is this happening? Like usually you're like, you know, you're like, why is, there's gotta be a reason why this is happening. This is so stupid. It's a sunshiny day, no cars around. And I stuck myself right into a snowdrift. And he was like, you prayed for a story. <laughs> Never again. Never again. I will just come up with something on my own. God, thank you very much. So we are in the final week of a teaching series called Seeds. We've been talking in this teaching series about you reap what you sow, which is a natural law, but it's also a supernatural law. Throughout scripture, God talks about the fact that what we plant, we will harvest. Jesus preached about it. It's all over in scripture. You reap what you sow. If you haven't heard these messages, you can catch them online, catch up. But the general gist is God says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap, right? And so this is in terms of like, if you want to experience forgiveness in your life, you've got to plant forgiveness. If you want to experience joy, plant joy. If you want to experience people judging you, feel free to judge others. You know, like we, whatever we put out there, 
is uh, what's going to come back to us in the spiritual world. And I think God does this because he wants to train us to always be planting good seeds and healthy seeds. And he motivates us with like, if you want this kind of life, you've got to plant this kind of seeds, right? So we talked about that. We also talked the first week about how one little seed planted actually reaps more than just one little seed back out, right? Because when you plant one seed, if it's like a kernel of corn, it grows a corn stalk with a bunch of ears and every ear has all this corn on it or sunflower seed, which of course we had all over the stage because Eric was preaching. Um, so what we plant, we also experience more of coming back at us. And this is just found throughout scripture as spiritual laws and regularly God plants, uh, points back at the, the natural laws as the parallel. And remember, God's in charge of the natural and the spiritual, right? The natural and the supernatural. The second week, last week, we talked about waiting and watering and being faithful when we're not seeing our harvest yet, because it's rare that we experience an insta harvest, right? You've got to plant that seed and then you wait. And sometimes it is so hard because you've planted the seeds and you're still experiencing the pain, but you're waiting for the breakthrough. You're waiting for the harvest. We talked about that last week. This week, we're talking about the harvest, although we're going to kind of come at it through the lenses of more planting and reaping. And this is because I found a really great passage of scripture that I really wanted to share. I was going to do this Wednesday, and I was like, ooh, you should do that this weekend. So that's why I'm here. Um, and also, that worked great because he's at home snorting and coughing and being disgusting. So... The theme verse for this uh, series and also for the crossing for this year is Galatians 6, 9. It says this, so because of that, let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. So let's keep planting seeds. Everybody say, just keep planting. Just keep planting. So today we're going to talk out of the book of Ephesians, Ecclesiastes. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Ecclesiastes. If you don't have your Bible, I want to encourage you to start bringing it. Here's why. Have you looked at the note sheet yet? I know. Any of my little box people like, oh, there's no blanks. It's a very large blank. You can fill it in with whatever you want. You can draw pictures, whatever you want to do. Here's the thing, we are, uh, the crossing is growing. We have more locations and every location has a preacher who preaches that message live. We don't put it on video. And so we are all preaching the same message. We all come in at, it, at it from different ways. And so the way to make this sustainable is to do a blank note sheet. So you'll have the slides and we will leave them up in the center long enough for you to be able to write down your points. Um, but you won't have the Bible verses in front of you. So we are starting a challenge, bring your Bible to church because you will get comfortable in your Bible, finding your way around. You can mark it up. It's not a rented school book, you guys. It's yours, and you can mark it up as much as you want. Um, so we're challenging you to do that. So we are in the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm going to pray super fast, and uh, we're going to roll. Jesus, thank you so much that throughout Scripture, we have practical ways to live out a life of faith. I pray that you will open our hearts and minds to what you want to say to us. We bind the enemy and distractions in the name of Jesus Christ. And Holy Spirit, we ask for your presence to uh, be strong here, to speak through me, and to tell each of us what you need us to hear, but then also give us the courage to walk it out when we go. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the book of Ecclesiastes is written by Solomon. King Solomon was the wealthiest, wisest king to ever rule Israel. Uh, he wrote the book of Proverbs, which is good. It's all full of tons of fortune cookie wisdom and wise stuff. Uh, he also wrote Ecclesiastes. Now, I like Ecclesiastes because it's kind of sarcastic and snarky just a little bit. You do not want to base your theology on the book of Ecclesiastes because sometimes he's like, all that matters is eating and drinking. Everything else just... <laughs> Like that's kind of, I mean, he doesn't say that because that's hard to write, but, um, but he, Solomon was so wealthy and he was, he was such a wise king that he was extremely successful. So the book of Ecclesiastes is how he set out to use his wealth and influence to make himself happy. And the whole book is, I did this, I tried this. He had everything he wanted. He had everyone he wanted, if you know what I mean. He had, like, he just, he could do whatever he wanted to try to make himself feel good, satisfied, like to achieve, um, you know, inner peace and, and all of that and just ultimate gratification. And throughout the book, he's like, 
It's meaningless. You've heard that it's meaningless. Everything is meaningless. I've been in Ecclesiastes a little bit this year. Uh, chapter three is the famous, like there's a time for everything, a time for every season under heaven. And we did twirl with that theme and I wrote the little devotional book. But in chapter 11, this is the end of the book. And it's kind of like back, in, back around to the end of the book, Solomon gets back into like how his mama raised him. And he says like, one of the last verses in the whole book says, um, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. So he circles around and says, but this is what matters. Fear God, keep his commandments, do what God's called you to do. The first part of chapter 11, there's a little section that has some planting and reaping stuff in it. So that's what we're going to explore today. Verse one, here we go. It's a weird one, you guys. Cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. Ecclesiastes 11, one. cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. So you're, you're supposed to throw your bread in the water and then one day it's going to float back to you. Now that's dumb. I mean, that doesn't make any sense at all. So I was doing some research. I was reading some commentaries and dug out the meaning of this. Like, what does this mean? Well, the word bread can be translated seed or even seed corn. So cast your seeds on the water, for it will return to you after many days. Still dumb. Like that doesn't make any sense. You would not plant in the Minnesota lake down the street. Like we don't plant in water. And that's the point of this verse. What Solomon is saying is, plant your seeds even when it feels like you're throwing it out in the water because it is still going to return to you in the form of a harvest. So as I was reading some commentaries, I came across this one from the pulpit commentary and the language is a little stilted, but just roll with it. This is what it says basically that this verse means. Do your kindnesses, exert yourself in the most unlikely quarters, not thinking of gratitude or return, but only of duty. It's the right thing to do. And yet surely a recompense will be made in some form or other, or you'll get something back. You'll find it after many days. This is not to be the motive of our acts, but it will in the course of time be the result. And this thought may be an encouragement to you. Kind of crazy, huh? Like, I think we've been coming at this teaching series with like, all right, Think about the harvest you want to reap, a healthy marriage, a healthy life, secure financially, um, uh, you know, whatever, whatever your harvest is, a successful business. Think about what the harvest is that you want to experience, like a wife that likes you, whatever it is. And then back up and figure out what seeds you need to plant that will eventually grow into that harvest, right? So we've been kind of motivated by the harvest and that's okay because God is a good dad who understands that motivating his kids with reward is a good way to get them to do the right thing. If like every time you did something good, you got punched in the face, eventually you'd stop. So God motivates us with blessings, blessings and harvest of good things. And like, that's good. But basically in this, in this verse, it's like, um, but PS, if you're a kid of God and you're following him, you got to do the good, whether or not the harvest comes. And sometimes it's going to feel like you're throwing out those seeds and they are just disappearing into the ocean. But do it anyway. I like how this Turkish, Turkish version of an Arab proverb, I couldn't figure out how to credit it, so there you go. But I found this is another phrasing of this verse and it says this, do good, throw it into the water. If the fish doesn't know it, God does. Do good, throw it into the water. Maybe nobody else will notice, but God does. And he's the one that brings the harvest. We don't look to the person, you know, when I'm trying to, I'm trying to reap, you know, like Eric's permission to buy some new shoes. Not that he has to give me that permission, but you know, so then I like, you can go to Cabela's, you know, and I'm like, you know, we're, we often are looking at if I do this, then I experience this. Like a lot of times we're looking at what is the harvest going to be? And we like kind of hope it's soon. But God just like, you know what? You do that good without expecting the return. Except P.S. You'll get the return because that's how God's world works. So number one, and it's super long because I'm a girl with a lot of words. 
plant good seeds at every opportunity, even if it looks futile. You will be happiest if you don't worry about trying to control the harvest. You will be happiest if you don't worry about trying to control the harvest. If you just say, I'm gonna plant those seeds, I'm gonna say those good words, I'm gonna call that relative that I have a rift with, even if they hang up on me, I'm gonna plant those seeds, and the result, I would like the result, great, but the harvest doesn't matter because I'm being obedient to God and it's really about me and God and not so much me and the other thing. An example of this would be um, the fact that the Crossing Church, we planted five new churches in 2018. Every time we plant a new church, we remove seeds from other locations that we have, and often it's from here, because it's the largest one, and then we plant them in another place. This is so hard, because when we do, our key people are gone. Like, we lose we lose leaders, we lose talented people, we lose people who, whose hearts are with us and that we're used to seeing every week, and then they're, they're gone. We, it is hard to take those seeds out of our seed bag and go plant them somewhere else. And then the other hard thing is, we had five new locations last year. We're gonna plant more this year. We cannot be guaranteed a harvest. When we planted those churches, we did not know if even one person would cross the line of faith and follow Jesus through the ministry of those churches. Now, what's awesome, many have, so yay, it's awesome, all of them. But we also can't know if they'll all be open still in two years. There's no way of knowing that, right? There is no guarantee of success. You look at all the stuff, churches fail and close all that every day a church closes. There is no guarantee of a harvest. It's hard, but we do it anyway because we are obedient to God and we trust him with the harvest. That's big scale. And think about it in a small scale. Words. Sometimes I know there's a family member who just shuts you down every time you try to open your mouth and you don't know if at any point they're going to look you in the face and be like, thank you. Or... Let's be in relation. You don't know. But we got to plant anyway. We leave the harvest up to God. We bring our offering to the house anyway and trust that he's going to provide for us. We've got to keep planting even when it looks like we're throwing it away. It's just a release of control of the harvest. We know inside it will come one day. But we got to release control of what it's going to look like and when it happens. Verse 2, give a serving to seven. Everybody say, serve seven. Serve seven and also to eight. Everybody say eight. eight. For you do not know what evil will be on the earth. Again, another weird Bible verse. Give a serving to seven and also eight. Or, you know, serve some people and serve some more. Maybe serve some more because you don't know what's going to happen is the general gist of this. But there's actually a little more depth into that. So St. Gregory from the 500s. Explain to us what Solomon meant by this verse, that there was some symbolism in there that I don't think we would even think of today. And here's what it is. Serve seven. Seven is a number that represents this temporary earth that we live in, the time we live in, that passes in sets of seven days. You with me? So seven represents earthly, temporary, this time in the natural world, it passes in sets of seven days. Seven represents that. The eight, he says, represents eternal life or eternity, eight being the infinity symbol. The eighth day, it said that Jesus raised from the dead on the eighth day. You're like, no, it was the third day, Kelly. I knew this church was off. <laughs> Think about it for just a second. Jesus, by raising from the dead, secured for us eternal life, right? God created the world in how many days? Well, six, and then he rested on the seventh, which was the Sabbath. So the eighth day would be the day after the Sabbath. The day after the Sabbath was the day that Jesus rose from the dead. So eight, representing eternal life bought for us by Jesus. So when Solomon is saying, serve seven, even eight, for you don't know what evil will come in the world, what he's saying is help people in the natural, but also the supernatural. 
So when we plant seeds and we do good deeds, we do people a disservice if we fill their bellies but don't save their souls. Luke chapter 16, 9 is kind of a parallel for this as well. Uh, Jesus says this, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Use your money or your abilities to help people, to influence people and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you into an eternal home. So you see in this verse, both aspects. Use your natural, your worldly resources to help people, to make friends, so you can tell them about Jesus and eternal life in Christ. And then one day when you walk into heaven, they will welcome you and say, hey, we're glad you're here. You're the reason we're here. But it also says basically like when your possessions are gone, you'll have friends. So you want to plant good seeds and help people because one day you might need help yourself. And remember what we sow, we will reap. So number two, help as many as you can with eternity in mind. Help as many as you can with eternity in mind or plant to save lives. We are called throughout scripture to feed the hungry, to heal the sick, to help the homeless, to uh, clothe those who need it. We're called to meet the physical, natural needs of people, but we always do that with the intent of opening a door to share Jesus who doesn't just care about your natural now, he cares about your eternity. He cares about your soul. He cares about peace that passes all understanding. These are the things that Jesus offers. In a world full of broken people, just a meal won't fix all the problems. Freedom from depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts fixes a lot of problems, and Jesus brings that. So when we plant our seeds, we wanna keep the temporary and the permanent in mind as well. Verses three through five. So here's your little, um, and P.S., this is a natural concept that is echoed in the supernatural world, okay? If the clouds are full of rain, it rains. If a tree falls to the south or the north in the place where it falls, there it is. He who observes the wind will not sow. He who regards the clouds will not reap. I'm going to stop there for a minute. So what he's saying is there's a natural world. And if it, a cloud's full of rain, it's going to rain. If a tree falls, it's down. Like things live, things die. It rains. It snows randomly on the way to church. Like things happen. You can't control that. You can't control that. Everybody say, I can't control that. So what it says is you have to plant anyway despite the circumstances around you. So Eric's grandpa and grandma were farmers. Grandpa loved basketball, ESPN. So if he got up each day in the spring, looked outside, said, hmm, it's pretty windy out there today. I'm gonna go watch ESPN. The next day he gets up and goes, oh, now there's a rain cloud. I'm gonna go watch TV. Would he ever, ever put any seed in the ground? No. You can't control the weather. You plant anytime you can, and you'll reap a harvest. And then you've got to harvest when the harvest is there, too. I can't tell you how many times we've trekked back from, from Iowa to Minnesota, which is a super boring drive, you guys. I did it this week. So boring. Um, and this week it was raining and my windshield wiper squeaked. <laughs> Uh, that's why I'm a little crazy today. Um, but I mean, driving in the dark from Iowa to Minnesota, driving through Iowa, we would see combines harvesting in the dark with their lights on, and you could just see the lights going across the field. They were harvesting while it was time to harvest, even though it was dark. You guys, we've got to plant our seeds even when it's dark. We've got to plant our seeds even when it looks like rain. We've got to plant our seeds even when it's uncomfortable. Number three, don't wait for ideal conditions to plant. Don't wait for ideal conditions to plant. Because we can come up with a billion reasons to not do the right thing, can't you? Oh my gosh, we were going to go to the gym yesterday. We kept talking about it and kept talking. We should go to the gym. We should really go to the gym. 
I suppose we should go to the gym. And then, you know, I was like, oh, I already showered. You know, like, can't go to the gym now. Like, we came up with so many reasons why. We did that Friday and Saturday, you guys. We suck at that. Because we are always looking for just the right feeling to want to go to the gym. I promise you, I will never feel like going to the gym. <laughs> and this is the truth. You will never feel like doing the right thing until you do the right thing and God changes your heart. You will never have enough money to tithe until you tithe and God will make sure you have enough money. How many of you have ever heard like a newly married couple say, yeah, we're gonna wait and have kids when we can afford them. <laughs> you can never afford a kid. They are so expensive. You can never afford a kid. We can come up with so many reasons to not do the right thing. I'm not saying have a kid is doing the right thing, like whatever, you, you do what you gotta do. But it's just that if you want to experience life, don't expect life to just pad everything for you and make you feel great and make you feel like you're on top of the world and then you're like, no, I can do good things. No, we do good things in the dark. We do good things in the rain. We do good things when we are lacking. We say when we have a need, we plant a seed because when the bills are coming and we know it, we say, God, I acknowledge that you are the giver of all provision, so I'm gonna give a little extra this month to acknowledge that you're gonna take good care of me. Like, that's what we do. We keep on planting. And here's why, because we, if you, um, if you go back to that verse, uh, Linda, I did this to her earlier too, uh, verses three through five, you see at the end of this, it says, as you do not know what is the way of the wind, in other words, you don't know how the wind works, right? Or how the bones grow in the womb of her who's, who is with child, so you don't know the works of God who makes everything. You can't know what God can do. Just like you don't know how the wind works, or it is just unfathomable how a perfectly healthy baby can grow in the womb of a woman who lives on Starbucks and waffle fries. Like, how does that work? God does it. God does it so we trust because he does it and we see him do miraculous things all the time. Verse six, in the morning sow your seed, and in the evening do not withhold your hand, for you don't know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. In other words, just keep planting. Just keep planting. In the morning when you get up, talk to God. God, give me eyes to see how I can plant today and how I can farm in your kingdom and then go all day. Now sometimes we like, we just work it up all day long and we just go through our day and we grit our teeth and, we, we, and then we get home and we just bleh all over our family. Why? Because it's a safe place to bleh. Unfortunately, when we don't give our family our best, we're planting those kind of seeds into our family. <laughs> How many of you know that one nasty word in the kitchen in the morning can set your whole family off for the day? Right? You know that? That's why I don't leave my room in the morning until I've had my coffee. Because I, it will, I'm just, I'm not a nice person in the morning. I know you think I am such a ray of sunshine all the time. Uh, I'm not a nice person in the morning. I know this. I have to talk to God first and also consume caffeine. And once I've had my coffee and I've talked to God, then I go and engage my world. And that is just the system that is set into place in our family so that when I do start engaging the world, I'm planting good seeds and not just nasty ones. Even this morning, Eric got up, even though he's sick, made the coffee for me because that's how it works. He plants good seeds into our marriage and, uh, and into our day. And I just know not to talk until I've had some. That's just, that's kind of how it goes. So the whole time we've been talking about this seeds teaching series and we picture like the farming kind of co concept, I always, my context for farm is Eric's grandparents' farm. I had the benefit of knowing them for many years um, before they passed a few years ago. So uh, grandpa and grandma Bulgy, Bud and Leona, we get up every morning on the farm and have their peanut butter toast. Grandma has peanut butter toast and then cereal and grandpa always put half and half on his cereal. But before you could eat, they had to open up the daily bread devotional and read the devotional and read the Bible passage that goes with it and pray. Then we could eat 
and then the farming started. And I just want to remind you that that simple act of choosing to engage God first in the morning can really set you on a path to plant a lot of good seeds throughout the day and let him guide you. Because we don't have to work up the energy or the ability to plant good seeds. The Holy Spirit does that for us when we engage him. That's the great thing about a relationship with God is you don't have to manufacture it yourself. His spirit just moves you forward, gives you eyes to see how you can plant that day. So we're going to wrap up by talking about what Jesus said about harvesting. We're in the book of John. Uh, how many of you have heard the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well? Jesus met her. He's like, I got water. You, you, you know, you'll never be thirsty again. All this. She's like, blew, blew her mind. And so then she runs back in the town. She's like, oh, you guys got to meet this guy. And there's this whole big to do. Well, when it was over, the disciples offered Jesus some food. Can we get you something to eat? Because clearly that was a big thing. And this was Jesus' reply. All right, John 4, 34. Jesus said to them, my food, or what sustains me, everybody say, what sustains me? I added those words in there, by the way. My food, or what sustains me, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say, or doesn't everybody say, okay, we'll calculate it out. There's still four months until the harvest. But I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields because they're already ripe for harvest. Now, he's not talking about the natural fields because they could look around and be like, there's four more months until harvest. This is weird, Jesus. But he's talking about the supernatural. He says, you think like in the natural world, there are seasons and it's predictable. In the supernatural world, there's something else at play here. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life. So when you sow, then you also reap. You reap the benefits from what you sowed, but also the eternal benefits, the people that you reap. That both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not even worked. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. Now, this is a little bit wordy, but let's just clarify it just a little bit. Jesus says, in the natural world, we know the seasons and we know when you can plant and harvest. In the supernatural world, there is harvest available all around you in the form of lives who need Jesus. We do not have to start from square zero and start planting seeds and that six years from now, get to lead somebody to Jesus. All we are called to do is look around right now today and we will see all around us there are people who are ready to hear about Jesus because seeds have been planted by somebody else. Seeds have been planted by somebody else. And many of you know this because you went a long time without knowing Jesus, but you had a grandma who prayed for you or you had a Sunday school teacher who told you the stories of Jesus and stuck the little things on the board and told you how he walked through and did miracles. Those were seeds planted and all around you are people in this world who maybe had flipped on TV and saw Joel Osteen tell them that God has something better for them. There are seeds being planted in lives all around you all the time and it is just up to us to look and to walk through open doors and opportunities to lead people to Jesus. And it can come in the form of just like a simple prayer. We look for opportunities, they're there. So um, I called somebody about some business this past week. When he answered the phone, I was like, hey, Ryan, how are you? And he goes, I'm, I'm all right. You know what that is? That's an open door right there. And I could have been like, great, so here's what I need to talk to you about. Or as I did, I was like, you're just all right? and he explained he had a sinus infection, and then that's an opportunity to say, hey, do you mind if I pray for you? These are little, and you're like, oh, I don't know if I could pray in front of somebody. You say, Jesus, heal this person, amen. Like, it's, even, it's easier than ordering at Starbucks. That's complicated. Asking somebody to heal, Jesus to heal somebody, not hard at all plants a seed. What can come of that? That person knows you pray. 
that person knows that when their life gets hard, there's somebody who actually cares about them they can reach out to. So many things that God can do that you don't understand, just like how the wind blows or a baby grows. We just get to be a part of it. So number five, you're not planting in a vacuum. We're in this together. You're not planting and harvesting in a vacuum. We are in this together. Not just together, each of us, but like I mentioned earlier when we read the Apostles' Creed, we have been dropped down into our time in human history, in God's story. And we get to join the labors of Christians for centuries and centuries. This isn't something new. The groundwork has been laid for years and years, and we just get to enter in and and start reaping the benefits and planting for the next generations, the next people to harvest. We sit here in this room right now. You sit here in this room right now because 15 years ago, a little group of 35 people started investing in a new local church. If you came to Jesus at the crossing, it was probably because of somebody you never even knew who planted seeds. And maybe you had a grandma who prayed and there's all kinds of seeds that were planted and then there you were. When we plant seeds in the house of God, when we give, when we share, when we work together to create a place where people can be loved and accepted and hear about Jesus, we are planting And the harvest is gonna be, it's, we may not ever physically see the lives that are rescued and changed until one day in heaven. But all around us, it's happening. So as we wrap up today, I wanna challenge you a couple things. If you're a long time Christian and you're feeling a little like, yeah, life's fine. I wanna remind you of the words that Jesus said. He said, my food or what sustains me is doing the work that God has sent me to do. In other words, what's going to sustain your faith long-term is engaging in the planting and the harvesting that God has called you to do. Because when we first meet Jesus, we're really excited and we serve everywhere and we, we like, oh, we start giving and all this stuff. And, and then after a while, it just kind of becomes habit, becomes life. And, and don't, it, it's God's good and that's great. And you're not like negative. You're just like, okay, but what will sustain your faith long-term is engaging in the calling he has on your life. And then I wanna talk to people who are, you're like, I don't know, I just started this whole Jesus idea thing. I'm new to this. Um, I wanna tell you, just start engaging and looking for ways to be able to plant good seeds. When you do that, you're gonna see God do all kinds of cool things around you. God is at work all around us. He is, His spirit is talking to people all around you. And He gives us opportunities to engage that. And if you have not chosen to follow Jesus with your life, can I humbly suggest that maybe today is your day? Today is your day, you're here. You're here for a reason. You might not wanna be here, but here you are. I want you to know you don't have to find your way through life. You don't have to struggle. You don't have to feel hopeless or helpless. You can know the peace that is crazy peace in the middle of a crazy world. You can get hope for the future. You can get purpose and meaning in life when you engage in the things God has for you. So I just wanna give each of us a chance to do whatever it is God's calling us to do in this moment. Maybe it's just a calling to keep planting where it feels like you're throwing it in the water, just a re-up. I'm gonna re-up, God, I'm gonna keep doing this. Maybe it's a calling to start planting good seeds even though the conditions don't seem ideal, to choose to be generous, to choose to share, to choose to look around and, and open your mouth and say the words even though they're hard. Or maybe to just choose today to do what we say, cross the line of faith and just say, I'm in. I'm gonna follow Jesus and see what happens. Can you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you're watching online, don't click off. Stay with it in this moment. You didn't just observe, you experienced. Let the Holy Spirit continue doing his work. In these moments, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And this prayer is primarily for those who need to give their lives over to the care of Jesus today. But for many of us, it'll simply be a re-up a reminder and we invite everyone to pray it out loud so that those who are praying it for the first time don't feel awkward. But you can just say this, Jesus Christ, thank you for giving your life for me. 
I receive your forgiveness for my wrongs. I put my life in your hands. Lead me, take me someplace good, and give me purpose. Amen. Father God, I just pray over every life that each of us will see that we are entering into the labors of Christians of thousands of years. That we're not on our own, we're not isolated. We share the same struggles, but we also share the same victories when we persist in doing good and planting seeds because we, choose, we trust that we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's tell God thank you.